Right, we might make a start. Good afternoon, everybody who's online. Um, there's about 28, 29 people online at the moment. Welcome to the August Living with Disability Research Centre seminar. I'm Chris Bigby, the director of the centre. Um, and we have uh, three presentations today, uh, which, which are a reflection on the significance of collaborative research partnerships. So it's going to talk um, about the research that's come out of the partnership between the Living with Disability Research Centre and the Summer Foundation, which is now, that partnership is now at least five years old, if not more. Um, so we're going to start off with uh, Professor Jacinta Douglas talking about how you change policy practice and systems through programmatic research rather than one-offs. And then Dr. Stacey Oliver is going to talk about being a pioneer in specialist disability accommodation. And Dr. Kate de Cruz is going to talk about hopes and expectations of participating in a co-design storytelling project. So welcome to this afternoon. And I'm going to hand over to, to Jacinta, who's going to speak first, and then she's going to take over as MC uh, for the rest of the afternoon. So I don't need to introduce Jacinta to everybody. She's very well known in the field, particularly of people working with people with acquired brain injury. She's an emeritus professor here. She has a worldwide reputation for the work that she's done in this field. So over to you, Jacinta. Thank you very much, Chris. And it's, it's lovely to be here this afternoon and have the opportunity to talk to everybody about um, actually each of these research pieces of research. So as Chris said, what I'm going to be talking about is really developing a research program to solve a problem and thinking about the, the problem much more from the perspective of an integrated number of issues that we need to address as we, as we move along. And that's really been very much what our um, partnership with Summer Foundation um, has been working on and looking at for us. And that is the issue of one single issue in a sense, but that has lots of different pieces of the puzzle. And that issue is, there we go. The focus of this research program is really to create, to lead and to demonstrate long-term sustainable changes that stop young people from being forced to live in nursing homes because there is nowhere else for them to live. So that's the focus of the program. And as we go through this presentation, which isn't long, it really is an introduction to the program, um, you'll see that it has many different aspects that we need to explore and that we need to contribute to. And in many ways, we use five tools for change in this process. And this process um, initially was, was, was initiated by the Summer Foundation and we joined together. And I'll show you that in a moment in a timeline um, where we come together in, in this work. So the tools of change that we actually focus on are research, that is we use a rigorous evidence base to inform potential solutions and not just to inform those potential solutions, but also to evaluate in interventions in that space. And I think both coming up with solutions and evaluating them is really pivotal to, to research in any of the fields that any of us work in. We then also inform the work we do through lived experience so that we engage those with lived experience of the issue of young people in residential aged care to inform, to co-design and to evaluate resources and tools for intervention. We're really working within a translational process so that not only are we understanding, but we're also developing resources to make change. We then look at the, the concept of prototypes. That is, we design, we test and we evaluate and prove those potential solutions and we market prototype interventions within the broader context of the community. We work really 
consistently and strongly to have an impact on policy. So we design, we influence and we advocate to establish best practice policy so that we can facilitate understanding of the problem and so that we can also facilitate implementation of policy that prevents the problem um, to that prevents the problem occurring in the future. And finally, we develop knowledge and we share resources and tools designed to build capacity of the system and to build capa capacity of market users. So they're the tools. This is the timeline for those of you who are not familiar um, with both the, the issue of younger people being forced to, to live in residential aged care, but also not familiar with the work of the Summer Foundation and um, not familiar with the work of our partnership. So you can see across the top here is the timeline. And back in 2006, the National Young People in Residential Aged Care Program um, started and the Summer Foundation through the work of, of Di Winkler, um, and Di is very much a co-author, which I didn't say at the beginning of this, of this actual presentation. Di is also an adjunct associate professor at La Trobe with us. So Di worked really hard to actually understand the problem at this point. She did a lot of research, developed a lot of evidence that could support the fact that um, for young people being forced to live in residential aged care, it was almost an infringement. It was an infringement on their human rights in many ways. They didn't have freedom. They didn't have the ability to have a social life. They were very much isolated. They were very much in a situation where there was a lot of um, anxiety, depression, and a sense of hopelessness. And then one of the things that kind of changed the landscape in a way was the National Disability Insurance Scheme coming along or the Productivity Commission in the first instance then recommending that we develop a National Disability Scheme to support people with disability in the Australian context. And we began our partnership with Summer Foundation in 2014 when the Summer Foundation set up and funded the, the Chair for Living Well with Brain Injury within the Living with Disability Research Centre. And that from my perspective, um, personally, and also from a, a sort of broader research perspective, began an excellent um, partnership that has continued to make great advances, I think, in the area. You can see too that this issue around young people in residential aged care and, and the challenges of residential aged care in and of themselves continued to be of interest at, a, at a, a, a government level. We had a Senate inquiry in 2015 that we um, made a submission to and we supported people with um, complex disability to make submissions to. We have had the Royal Commission more recently into aged care generally. We've had YIPRAC targets and a strategy set very recently, and we'll, we'll finish with those targets um, later at the end of this presentation. And we've had the Royal Commission um, into disability. And, and so all of those things have come together really to, to support the need for change, to support the urgent need for change in this, in this context. So when we have a look at the evolution of the research program from its beginning at the Summer Foundation with Di founding the Summer Foundation and setting up that work to now, we can see that the program began with setting up an evidence base to understand who and why the outcomes, who and why outcomes happened within the context of the national Young People in Residential Aged Care Program from 2006 to 2011. So it was really starting off with understanding the problem and understanding the people who were impacted by that problem. It then moved to developing some practical solutions. And within that, the Summer Foundation was instrumental in developing housing demonstration projects. And they were focused on the whole concept of if you're being forced to live in res residential aged care, then we need to develop options. We need to develop alternatives to residential aged care for, um, 
for homes for people who were in that negative situation. They also worked a lot on stories about the both the difficulties of living in residential aged care, but the joy of being released from residential aged care for young people in the stories that were actually um, developed and are available on the Summer Foundation website that you can have a look at that really give you a sense of that lived experience. And the Summer Foundation also worked very hard to connect young people in residential aged care to the NDIS to be able to look for alternative options and to be able to find appropriate housing and support. And now more recently, what we have is very much a programmatic approach with a rigorous and practical, with the development of rigorous and practical research to provide the evidence base, not for immediate change, but also for change that occurs now, but for change that can persist, for enduring change in the sector. So our team now um, has grown from 2006, where the team at the Summer Foundation was um, probably three to five people, at least in 2014, not many more than that, um, when I started working with the Summer Foundation, to being more than 20 people. It's not just the number of people that's important in this team, but it's the disciplines they reflect, it's the experience they bring with them that is important to how the team actually how, how the team works together and complements each other. So that we have people who are physios, we have people who are occupational therapists, we have speech pathologists, we have psychologists, we have people who have worked in the clinical context for many years, and we have people who've been research expertise together with clinical expertise. So we have a lot of content knowledge within the team. We have people who are early in their development. So we have um, research assistants who are doing summer internships and we have people um, who are really old, like me, a long way into their research career. Um, all of, so all the way from the, the sort of early career researcher to the, to the late career researcher. And you're going to hear from two of these gorgeous people today um, when Stacey and Kate talk to you about the two projects that they're going to um, be able to share with you. So we're a, we're a big, energetic, enthusiastic team. And if you think about the system that admits young people to aged care, it's a particularly complex system. So we need a big team because there's lots of places you need to address, if you like, um, this wicked problem from. If you think about a young person ending up in residential aged care, somebody under the age of 65, and remembering that that number still might be as many as 60 people being admitted every month. Um, it's important to think about the pathway that the person reaches that, that destination from. And probably the most typical pathway is a person who has a catastrophic acquired brain injury, who has a brain injury without warning. Um, it may well be due to assault, motor accident, co workers' compensation um, situation where somebody is injured at work, has a fall, etc. And so you have this episode or this event occur. The person is then admitted to hospital. And from that acute setting, it is possible in some cases for the person to be seen as having such complex problems that in fact they move directly through an aged care assessment team and they move into potentially into, into um, respite care in the, in the residential aged care setting until things can be sorted through from the point of view of, of, a, of a transition. For most people, however, they then have a period of rehabilitation. And at that point, that becomes another point where in fact the person can be discharged from subacute um, or community rehabilitation through the aged care assessment process to living per, to a permanent discharge to residential aged care. 
In some cases, there's a transitional period of time where the person goes into a transitional environment to continue to work on goals. And for some of these people, then they actually move into alternative housing and support and stay there for quite a significant period of time for some, but others where difficulties develop, it again may be a pathway back to residential aged care. The other really um, well used, if you like, pathway to residential aged care is the pathway of the person with disability living in the community who has a deterioration in their condition, who actually might have a change in their environment. People who are able to support them in the community may longer be able to do that. So it may be elderly parents. Um, and at that point, the choices are really quite few or were really quite few for that person. So again, we have this pathway through to potentially permanent, permanent residential aged care for that person. And you can see, it's a little bit like the, I often think of it as the, as the London underground or even our underground loop, whereby there's lots of other pathways from different components of this. The person who has deterioration, for example, may in fact end up in the acute hospital and follow a different pathway into permanent residential aged care. Up until quite recently, the other sector that this problem intersected with was primary health was that in fact primary health in the community can support the person to stay in the community and health is a really that interface between health and disability is a really important part of this of this puzzle more recently and if we go they're the two pathways that i just went through if we have a look at this slide you can see that the introduction of the national disability insurance scheme has made a difference in the sense that it gives an interface between disability and support and potentially alternative accommodation or housing um, with this pathway. So again, this kind of emphasises the complexity of it, but it also emphasises the fact that now we have potentially a pathway, if you like, out or a pathway of better outcomes if a person can access appropriate support and appropriate um, opportunities for housing, for having a home in the community, for living the life as that person wants to live it, um, then in fact the National, in, uh, the National Disability Insurance Scheme brings us some alternatives. So at that point, with the introduction of the NDIS, really the focus of the program has grown. So we have a focus on how do we prevent admissions to residential aged care. We also have a focus of how can we make sure that the National Disability Insurance Scheme works well for this group of people. Does it actually prevent admissions? Or for people who are living in aged care, does it provide a pathway to a better life so that they have support to be able to participate in the community. And again, as I said, this, this health pathway um, intersects with all of, all of those different um, aspects of the problem. So that's the complexity of it. And our research program now looks at finding solutions, developing solutions and evaluating solutions through three foundational components of research work. We start with literature reviews, with scoping literature reviews in most cases because there's not enough interventions for them to be systematic literature reviews where you look at the impact of interventions. But we look at what has been tried and we look at what it works and we look at getting a really rich understanding of the problem from research that um, has come before the research that we're planning. It's kind of like, you know, if you don't check out what's happened in the past, then you are stuck with making the same mistakes. So that same, if you like, philosophy applies to research. Make sure you know what's been tried in the past in a particular area. 
We then also work on administrative data sets. That we, is, we glean what we can from data that's out there in administrative data sets. That might be looking at trends for admission to residential aged care. It might be looking at um, regional differences across states. It may be looking at um, the intersection. Well, it may be looking at a data set that tells us what are the characteristics of the young people who end up in residential aged care versus what are the characteristics of people who are discharged from rehabilitation, not to residential aged care, but back to the community. So it helps us understand what some of the predictors, what some of the factors are that shape that outcome. And it also helps us understand what's happening within systems and along those pathways as we, as we move through the process. And then the third, if you like, foundational block of research is primary research, where we are looking at the needs and preferences and outcomes of people who fall into this population. And we have a look at the impact of the NDIS. We pilot interventions ourselves, we develop prototypes, and we continue to evaluate all of that work as we move through the process. So it keeps us busy. It gives it all of those more than 20 people plenty, plenty, plenty to do. And you can see here what, what this slide does, or what this infographic does, is actually map those types of research approach or those types of studies onto where we have been able to develop evidence and publish evidence in the area. So you can see that scoping reviews, which are the red dot, we've done scoping reviews in the context of primary health. We've done scoping reviews in the context of what does extended rehabilitation potentially do for people who might be at risk of moving into, into um, residential aged care. We've looked at alternative housing and support for people with disability generally. What happens if somebody moves from from residential aged care or from congregate care into individualised housing, what sort of outcomes are achieved. And we've looked, we've looked at the impact of um, living in permanent residential aged care. And that's a pretty daunting um, piece of work to look at in the sense of the negative outcomes that we have there. You can see the yellow dot is administrative data. So we've looked at administrative data at many different points We've looked at administrative data related to acute hospital data. We've looked at administrative data re related to what are the things that are revealed when we look at those people who, have, who are young people who have aged care assessment all the way along these pathways. And then our primary research, you can see um, all the way through this process, we have primary research in the context of rehab, in transition, we have primary um, research in the context of housing and support and in, in the outcomes that we follow through for people. We look at planning implementation with respect to the NDIS and we look at the quality and availability of services. So it's a big program with a lot of activity and some excellent outcomes that we have available to share with people working in this area. So we've done a scoping review looking at younger people living in aged care and what that means. We've looked at individualised housing. We've looked at the quality of paid disability support. So what are the factors that feed into quality? What are the factors that are imperative for quality and are needed to maintain quality of disability support? And we've also um, looked at the contribution of smart home technology to being able to improve the ability of people with complex needs to live in housing, in, to live in a home of their choice. These other scoping reviews are currently underway, looking at discharge planning, primary health needs, and we also um, have a project looking at the, this context for people with Huntington's disease. Oops, sorry. 
So with respect to administrative data, again, we've got work here looking at aged care data and trends. We have linked aged care data to other data sets, for example, to the um, Australian Rehabilitation Outcome Centre data sets. We've looked at um, particular states. We've looked at the hospital data from the point of view of discharge to residential aged care in Victoria. We've also in the process of looking at that same question in the context of New South Wales. And um, we're looking at inpatient rehabilitation data as, as well as subacute and longer term rehabilitation data. And we're looking at primary health data with respect to um, factors associated with that negative outcome. From a primary research perspective, we've developed um, a project where um, participant led videos, that is videos designed for and by people who have disability to be able to show their preferences with respect to support to support workers. All of those resources around the participant led videos that are available on the Summer Foundation website showing you how to develop the videos. So we, we looked at it and we evaluated it from, a, from the perspective of can this be done and found out it could be done. Then we did a feasibility study to see whether it could be easily done by people who weren't specialists in the field. Um, that could we train them in a workshop on a day and found out that we could. And all of that information is available on the Summer Foundation website. Um, we have primary research looking at the quality of paid disability support, and that's um, in the context of Megan Topping's PhD, and Megan's getting the perspective of people with disability, perspective of their close others, and perspectives of disability support workers. We're looking at support coordination. What are the important aspects of support coordination from four perspectives, from the perspective of people with disability, their close others, the perspective of health professionals and support coordinators themselves. And we're looking at discharge planning. And we're also looking at supported disability accommodation and tenant outcomes. Those last two studies are national longitudinal projects that we're conducting over three years. So we're publishing inter interim reports along the way throughout this process so that we're feeding information back into the system as we develop information. So this is pretty much it for my introduction and I'm pretty much on time in the sense that this all started with one of the most complex problems you can think about, a problem that crosses many systems, health, disability, and the aged care system. And we know from experience that the more systems that are involved, the more likely it is for problems to fall in the cracks between those systems. So it was a complex problem. And you know, it really wasn't until quite recently that there were concerns about it, whether or not it was a fixable problem. But I think we can finish this component of our presentation today by saying it is a fixable problem. And it's a fixable problem because a lot of the work that the Summer Foundation has put in over 21 years, and more recently, because of the work that we've been able to do together from um, our partnership with the Summer Foundation and the Summer Foundation's partnership with us, I should say. So for the first time ever, I can say that we have real targets, that the government has set real targets. And the Summer Foundation has played a really big part in that by sitting on the reference group for the strategy development for younger people in residential aged care and having a big say and actually interacting with government to change policy. But we have real targets by 2022 that no young people should be entering RAC, entering residential aged care. I'm happy to hold a party when that happens. Um, and invite anybody who wants to come. And by 2025, to have no younger people living in residential aged care, except those who choose to. It doesn't seem like a big ask, does it? But 
in fact, when we were looking at trends, when I first started at the Summer Foundation, it was nearly 5,000 people who were living in residential aged care, some of whom were 19, some of whom were, were 23, some of whom were mothers of young children and fathers of young children. So it's a, it's a human rights issue that we should be able to live where we choose. And people with disability should be able to live where they choose. And that kind of is the nub of the problem, making sure that we allow people to have that choice in their lives. Now, um, at the end of this is our recent publications. All of them, pretty much all of them are open access. So any of the, the data that we've been able to develop, any of the solutions we've tested can, are available. And that reference list um, can be made available through the seminar today. And you can have a look at all of those publications, choose the areas that you're interested in and see what knowledge base exists out there and what evidence exists to support you in making an argument to make sure that the people you have contact with in whatever role you have contact with them in are not forced to live in residential aged care. Thanks. So, so let me introduce Stacey. Stacey is a research fellow um, at Summer Foundation. She's a PhD, finished her PhD actually sitting over in psychological sciences at La Trobe University several years ago now. Um, Stacey's been at Summer Foundation and has been working on a number of different projects, but the work that she's presenting today is a qualitative study of the experience of moving into new specialist disability accommodation from the perspective of adults with neurological disability. A beautiful piece of work. So welcome, Stacey, and enjoy sharing the findings that you have today. Great. Thanks, Jacinta. Um... Hi everyone, I don't think I need to introduce Summer Foundation anymore after that beautiful explanation um, and introduction from Jacinta, so I'll just get stuck straight into it. Um, so historically, um, people with disability have had limited choice um, regarding where and with whom they live. Um, and they have often lived separate from the community in congregate housing um, or what is known as group housing. And although this arrangement is suitable for some, um, it can also result in negative outcomes for those who don't choose to live in such an environment. And as you can see on the slide, um, housing for people with disability is now moving away from that congregated style of living um, towards more individualised models of housing. And individualised models of housing really aims to give people more um, choice in their housing and support arrangements, as well as the options to live in houses that are located in the community. Um, but despite this move towards individualised models of housing, uh, there is currently limited research that investigates the outcomes of tenants who move into individualised housing. Uh, we do know from the available evidence in the intellectual disability context that meeting an individual's housing needs and preferences, um, it contributes to positive life outcomes, uh, including increased self-determination and autonomy, increased home and community participation, as well as improved mood and social relationships. Um, however, the outcomes for people with acquired complex disabilities um, are still largely unknown. So given this gap in evidence, um, the aim of this research project is to better understand the experience of moving into um, individualised housing from the perspective of people with acquired complex disability. And for the purposes of this presentation, we're just going to focus on that transition experience of moving into a new house. Um, and we're going to focus specifically on the experiences of people who have moved into the 10 plus one model of individualised housing. So the 10 plus one model of housing is funded by the Australian government um, by what is called Specialist Disability Accommodation or SDA funding. And SDA funding is um, for people with a disability and complex care needs who require housing specifically designed to maximise independence um, or to improve the efficiency of the delivery of person to person support. Um, so as is highlighted on this slide, the 10 plus one model of SDA incorporates accessible design, 
smart home technology, uh, the co-location of support, and is situated in a desirable location that is connected to the local community. Um, and the 10 plus one model was developed to enable people with high support needs to be able to live in their own apartment, um, but be co-located um, to enable the cost effective provision of support. And how this works is that SDA providers purchase six to 10 apartments off the plan. And then these apartments are then modified to be SDA compliant. Um, providers also purchase one additional apartment, um, which is used as a base for 24 hour on-site support. And these apartments are peppered throughout larger mainstream residential developments, um, which include more than 70 apartments. So this qualitative study used constructivist grounded theory methodology. Um, In-depth interviews were conducted to capture participants' experiences at two time points. Um, and this was before participants moved into their new home um, and then again six to 24 months after they moved. Uh, interviews explored participants' quality of life, community participation, social connection and support use and were conducted by allied health researchers. Um, who had experience working with people with complex needs and communication difficulties. Um, and this study reports on 10 participants between the ages of 30 to 57 years um, who had a range of disability types. Uh, prior to the move, participants lived in a range of environments with most moving either from shared supported accommodation, um, residential aged care, and some moving from their parents' homes or private rentals. Um, so a total of 20 interview transcripts were analysed with double coding of half of the transcripts. Uh, analysis was guided by constructivist grounded theory uh, using the method of constant comparison. So analysis, was con analysis consisted of two main phases of open and focused coding. Um, and axial coding enabled the exploration of relationships across participants, uh, supporting the development of themes and sub-themes. So two key themes uh, emerged from the data analysis with associated sub-themes uh, that describe the experience of moving into and living in new 10 plus one apartments. So the first theme relates to participants' pre-move experiences um, and experiences in people's pre-move homes were described as being not a good fit. And these were characterized by feelings of hopelessness and as though life had little meaning. Participants who had moved from congregated living described feeling stuck in their pre-move environment, uh, while those who were living in private homes shared concerns about being a burden upon their family. Um, so the second theme relates to participants' experiences during the first 24 months of living in their new homes. Participants described feeling like a pioneer in their new SDA home. Um, and this period of transition between the two environments was a valued opportunity. However, it was also a really challenging time of adjustment for participants. Um, people commonly spoke about the challenges of navigating new and complex policy um, and feeling unprepared to move into their new SDA home. However, despite these challenges, participants post move experiences um, also had an overarching sense of moving in the right direction. Um, and this included feeling encouraged to become more independent, um, an increase in confidence and an uplifted mood. So now I'm just going to go through the sub themes in a little bit more detail. So the first sub theme sitting under not a good fit was primarily concerned with participants experiences of having limited choice and lack of autonomy in their pre move environment. Um, people spoke about having a lack of privacy, routines that were either rigid or not in their control, um, and also having limited or no choice in regards to their meals or housemates. Um, and Darren shares his experience of a rigid routine here. Um, he says, they put you on a timetable and your time is to have a shower at 8.30. You've got to have a shower then, otherwise you don't get a shower at all. And in addition to lacking autonomy in everyday life, participants described having limited meaningful social relationships. Uh, participants spoke about uh, being unable to have their friends visit um, and then also um, being unable to plan their social activities. And the emotional toll of these um, relationships was also discussed. Um, and Peter shares his experience here. He says, I struggled a lot. I think while I was in aged care, my friend came once one friend once, and I felt really awkward about it. 
So for many participants, their pre-move housing environment was their only option and not one that they chose. Uh, participants commonly described feeling pressure to accept their pre-move housing vacancy, uh, particularly those who were living in shared supported accommodation or aged care. And this is highlighted by Susan, who says, uh, they next got back to me and said, we found a bed for you. Notice the language, we found a bed for you. Um, and other participants spoke about the trajectory of living with parents and knowing that their living environment was not a suitable long-term option. Um, so now we'll explore participants' experiences in the first 24 months after they had moved home. Um, and this is where a lot of the new learning is happening. Um, so this is what we're discovering a lot about people's experiences are like in what is still a very new model of housing. Um, so I just want to wanted to contextualise the following sub themes with the overarching experiences that participants liken to being a pioneer. Um, and this speaks to the speaks to encountering experiences that are new to not only the participants themselves, but are also quite new in a broader context. So part of being a pioneer included the challenges of navigating new and complex policy. Um, and the newness of SDA is highlighted by Andrew, who says SDA is new. It's not something that many people know about. And this sort of contributed to many challenges, um, including finding clear and consistent information regarding NDIS funding and SDA options. Um, and further related to being a pioneer was feeling a sense of um, unpreparedness to move into their new SDA homes. And this feeling of being unprepared included not having adequate information regarding the many choices, uh, choices that come with moving into a new SDA home, um, including how to pick a quality support provider, how to build and manage a support team, um, and also other unexpected challenges that just come with moving house. Um, and participants also commonly described uh, grabbing an opportunity so that they could move out of their pre-move um, home environment. Um, but despite the challenges, our participants post-move experiences did have an overarching sense of uh, moving in the right direction. So this included feeling encouraged to become more independent and a desire for even more independence. Um, and this is captured nicely by Susan, who says, uh, that's what I want to do moving in here. I wanted to be able to grow in independence and not need so much help. I'm looking forward to, you know, just that next step of being a little bit more independent. Uh, participants also described feeling like they could do more and some were implementing changes so that they could become even more independent in their new homes. Um, and this sense of moving in the right direction is sort of further highlighted by participants describing an increase in confidence and uplifted mood um, and feeling as though life had really opened up to them. Um, so while the move into the new SDA home was challenging at times um, and sometimes overwhelming as well, it was also an exciting time for people. Um, and pe people were generally optimistic about their future. Um, so now we'll go through the sub themes relating to participants post move experiences in a bit more detail. So this sub theme building a support team um, describes participants experiences of recruiting support workers based on their own preferences and needs. Uh, participants felt empowered to make decisions about the recruitment of their support workers, um, including being able to hire and dismiss staff. And Mary shares her experiences recruiting her support team. We do have our own team of workers, so everyone's got their own team and different times that they come in. I have a really great team, you know, because we're within our rights to say if we don't want that person, we can choose to dismiss them. And participants also spoke about the value of having a familiar team who they felt comfortable with, um, working collaboratively with their support team, and also of having support workers that um, are invested in their care. And it was also really commonly highlighted that support workers play a big role in participants' daily quality of life. Um, and this is highlighted by Susan, who says, I'm feeling valued rather than just a job or a chore to be done. I feel like these people who are helping me get ready are invested in the fact that I feel ready to go out and it changes your outlook on facing the day. Um, participants also spoke about how support arrangements in their new homes allow for more control over their daily routine. And it was also highlighted that living with 24-7 on-site support allowed participants increased privacy 
due to having support available to them, but not always having support uh, in their homes. Uh, and although the opportunity um, and importance of building a support team was really valued, participants still experienced difficulties with their support arrangements. Uh, these included difficulties finding reliable support workers that provide high quality care and that are also the right personal fit. So while participants valued having control over their, their support arrangements, um, they also discussed the challenges that came with managing their support. And these challenges included coordinating a large team of support, uh, getting the support roster right, and also communicating with their support coordinator. Uh, participants also spoke about the on-site support model uh, being different to what they anticipated. Participants described experiencing delays with the on-site support responses, uh, and also having limited choice with who provides the on-site support. Uh, participants highlighted that getting support arrangements right takes a considerable amount of energy and effort and it is something that really requires ongoing monitoring and this is highlighted nicely by Cara who says um, my support arrangements are more settled but it would be reasonable to say that it's always evolving and always fluctuating. So central to participants' um, experiences of moving into their new SDA home uh, was also navigating new responsibilities and challenges that come with having your own place. So these responsibilities included paying bills, planning meals um, and managing home maintenance, such as plumbing and smart home technology issues. Um, these responsibilities were challenging at times and participants spoke about the concerns of keeping on top of, the, keeping on top of bills um, also the time that's required to plan meals and the inconvenience of maintenance issues. Um, however, participants still valued the increased freedom and control that came with their new responsibilities, um, such as organising maintenance themselves. And this is shared by Cara, who says, if we want maintenance done, we organise it. I don't have to wait for somebody else to do it or for their approval to do it. And participants also spoke about feeling more confident due to managing these responsibilities. Um, and this is captured nicely by Sammy, who says, it's allowed me to grow, like with confidence and, you know, being able to manage things. I feel like I can do a lot for, more for myself. Um, participants also spoke about how there was a lot going on in their lives and how um, they were feeling busy and quite tired. Participants spoke about the challenges of settling into their new home and that settling in was taking longer than they expected. Um, Susan shares her experiences of settling in, which I think highlights sort of the enormity of the task of moving for participants. Um, I still don't feel completely settled. I've still got boxes of stuff that I can't find home for, homes for. Those kinds of things overwhelm me. Um, and many people also spoke about adjusting to the differences in their pre and post move living environments. Um, and these included adjusting to not having uh, carers in their home all day um, and also managing disability related challenges associated with more independence. Um, and part of the settling in process included making further adjustments to the physical environment so that their homes were even more individualized and suited to them. Uh, and these adjustments to the physical environment are important as they allow for even further independence and self-management of responsibilities. Um, and this is highlighted by Lisa who says, um, I can't get to the fridge. There's so many things I can't do because it's not designed for me. <clears throat> um, participants' experiences around moving into their new SDA, SDA homes also touched on setting up their new environment to become a home. Uh, participants described experiencing new choices that have not previously been available to them, such as choosing meals, choosing who comes in and out of the house, uh, getting a pet, and also selecting their own belongings. Uh, and the autonomy in the home is highlighted by Cara, who says, I like being able to set it all up myself and then I can do what I need to do and there's no one stopping me from doing it. Uh, participants were also enjoying the increased autonomy in daily activities and being able to go out on their own terms um, and being in control of their own routine. So it was also commonly mentioned um, that people were enjoying the increased privacy and being able to spend time alone in their new SDA homes. 
uh, participants were enjoying the quiet um, and enjoying spending time in their own homes. So uh, this is highlighted nicely by Sammy, who says, I feel like I'm having more time to myself, which is really what I enjoy. People were also feeling safe due to, de due to the design of the building, uh, having 24 seven on-site support and also having support workers that were concerned about their safety. Uh, participants were also enjoying going out more and starting to build connections in their local community. Uh, people spoke about going to local shops, cafes and community clubs and people were starting to get to know um, other people in the area such as shopkeepers and baristas. And all these elements contributed to feeling more comfortable in their new homes. Um, so this study aimed to capture the experience of moving into newly built, well located and appropriate design housing um, that includes appropriate support. So as outlined in the key themes, um, the findings suggest that moving into individualised housing um, is a positive shift uh, in the right direction. And while, while it is recognised that this first 24 months is a really significant time of adjustments for participants um, and participants likening this experience to being a pioneer, it's also a really valued experience of increased choice, autonomy um, and choice and autonomy in people's daily lives. Uh, the findings also emphasise the importance of having a good team of support um, and really highlight the challenges involved in getting um, the support team right. Uh, further challenges included setting up and tailoring the environment to meet people's individual's needs. Uh, an important implication from this research is the potential opportunity to better understand how to best support people who are moving into individualised housing. Um, in particular, supporting people to set up and manage a team of support workers. Um, and while the findings provide us valuable insights into the transition phase of moving into individualised housing, it's also important to acknowledge that the data presented today is just the first two time points of a longitudinal study. And this study is looking at how people's experiences of living in individualised housing change over the time. Uh, and this longitudinal project will provide some much needed insight into how people continue to adjust um, to the ongoing benefits and also the ongoing challenges um, of living in individualised housing models. Cool, so that's all. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so it's again my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kate de Cruz. Um, for those of you who've been around La Trobe for quite a while, you'll probably recognise Kate and know Kate. Kate worked for many years in the in the discipline of occupational therapy at La Trobe University. We were very um, happy to steal her away to Summer Foundation, although she's in an adjunct role also um, at La Trobe University. And I have the pleasure of continuing to work with her in, in both environments. So that's, that's a very good outcome from my perspective. Kate's going to talk to us today about a really important area, and that is, the area of co-design and I love the title in the sense of this presentation because it takes the essence of of the participants perspective I have always wanted to work like this but felt it was out of reach and you also capture I think the important issues around hopes and expectations in your title um, Kate where you talk about participants hopes and expectations of participating in a co-design storytelling project. So welcome Kate. As I said, Kate, Kate's a senior um, research fellow at Summer and an adjunct um, lecturer at La Trobe University. So take it away Kate. Thank you so much Jacinta and um, thanks to both Jacinta and Stacey for talking first and really setting the scene beautifully for today's presentation around co-design. Um, before I continue, I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, so Jacinta and Di Winkler, and also those who were involved in the development of this co-design project. So there are a number of really key players um, and you know who you are and I really appreciate your involvement. So first of all, I'm gonna set the scene for this co-design project. So there's the project and then there's the evaluation or the research um, exploration of the co-design project. So first of all, the co-design project and the aim of this was to design and create tools to build the capacity of people with disability to take action to move out of aged care into inclusive housing. So we've just heard 
from Jacinta and Stacey about the Summer Foundation's work to try and help both prevent young people um, with disability going into aged care if they don't want to or don't, um, that's not their choice, but also the efforts to try and help people move out of aged care if that's their choice. Um, and in this work, we're recognising that it's one thing to try and create choice, it's another to support and prepare people to make that move. And it's a really difficult move to make, especially when you've been living in an institutionalised aged care facility. So this project was really seeking to draw on the lived experience of those who have made this move to then co-design and create tools to try and build the capacity of others to also make that move. And you'll see here on the slide, uh, with the co-design work, true to co-design, there was a process here over a 12 month period of time, which began with recruitment of participants. So we sought people with lived experience of disability and people who have moved out of aged care to participate in this project, but to also to be employed in the, the capacity that they wanted to be employed. So positions were advertised, people submitted um, an application and were interviewed. And through that process, there was an enormous amount of learning around people's capacities, skills and strengths. And then there was a really quite in-depth process of tailoring the roles to meet the specific strengths and abilities of the participants. Then there was the process of co-design, which was a series of workshops that, because of the context we're in, were conducted online um, as a group, really exploring and understanding this issue, trying to identify what are the barriers to people moving out of aged care, um, what might be some enablers, um, brainstorming together and then planning what might these tools look like. Then there was a process of the co-creation. So people broke into smaller teams or project groups. Three different types of tools were identified as what the group wanted to work on. So there were three separate groups that then worked to creating those tools. Um, it was a collaborative process. Um, there was also a process of coming back to the other teams and just checking in on how people were progressing and whether these tools were likely to hit the spot. Um, and now we're in a process where the tools have been made and it's a sharing of tools. So how best to disseminate um, these tools. So I think when you go back to that earlier slide that just shared around the Summer Foundation work, you can see here through the co-design process, that idea of identifying a need, co-creating a solution, and then working together to try and disseminate that solution so that it actually does have impact. Um, the other point just to make is that there were 10 people with lived experience who uh, were recruited to this particular project. Five people were identified or were employed in roles called lived experience partners. So they had quite a significant role in the work. They were interested and able to dedicate sufficient time and they were open to being employed on a short term basis um, and being paid for their work. The lived experience contributors was another group of five people who didn't have as much time to commit to the project and for various reasons didn't feel that payment was going to work well for them um, and so they were then remunerated through vouchers and their, their contribution was a little bit less than the lived experience partners. Um, and there's also three co-design facilitators who were employed already at the Summer Foundation. So that's the co-design project. Um, and I'm in a lovely position to say that the tools have been created. So I thought just at the beginning of this presentation, I would give you a, a quick little insight into these tools. So there were, as I said, there were three different tools produced. So the first is a three part podcast series, which is a conversation about disability and leaving a nursing home between two people with lived experience of disability. There's a three part audio series, which really focuses on unsurprisingly after Stacey's presentation on choosing and managing your own support. Um, and then there's four short videos about Helen's own experience of moving out of a nursing home into her own apartment. And each of these um, tools also have written transcripts as well as being audio or visual tools. And you can find them on the Housing Hub website, which is a sister organisation with the Summer Foundation. Um, so please keep your eyes out for those tools. Um, so that's the context of the co-design project. And then wrapped around that was some research because we saw this as a wonderful opportunity to learn about co-design, particularly in the context of working with really people with complex disability. So the aim of the research project was to explore the experience of participating 
in a co-design project from the perspective of partners or contributors and facilitators with and without lived experience of disability. So we had a combination of players in this project, many drawing on lived experience of disability, some not, all employed in various capacity by the Summer Foundation. And we were really interested in identifying or learn about learning about enablers and barriers to co-design engagement, potential capacity building benefits for the actual people involved in the co-design work, and potential peer connection benefits, again, for the people engaged in the co-design work. So we used a qualitative methodology, um, focusing on the use of constructivist grounded theory, because we wanted to really understand the in-depth experience or the lived experience of people involved in the co-design project. So similarly to what Stacey described, we conducted interviews with each of the participants in the project. There was also reflective journals completed by the co-design facilitators. So after every workshop, they, they wrote out their reflections um, and shared that as part of our data collection. And we engaged in a process of constant comparative data analysis, um, which included a series of open and focused coding, um, and that's still in the process currently. So as you can see here on this slide, um, there are a number of phases to this project. So there were interviews conducted prior to the project starting, but after people were recruited to the project, midway through the co-design project, and then follow-up interviews at the end of the project, and an evaluation of the tools that were produced. So identifying from the participants how satisfied they were with the tools that were produced and how useful they thought they would be. And while there's lots and lots of data there, today I'm just talking about the initial interviews. So talking about what people were thinking, their hopes and their expectations about this co-design project. So out of the 10 uh, people with lived experience of disability and the three co-design facilitators, who were involved in the co-design project, we had the three co-design facilitators consent to participate in this research and six of the lived experience partners and contributors. And you can see there on the slide, what I, what I love about this project is that we had a real mix of people with and, with, with and without lived experience of disability and other skills or experience that contributed to their co-design work. Um, so you can see for the facilitators, we had one physiotherapist, two occupational therapists, and one of the occupational therapists is also a stroke survivor. And then we had, um, with the lived experience partners or contributors, there was someone who had experience in accountancy, a teacher, an artist, and people with lived experience of acquired brain injury, muscular dystrophy, MS, stroke, and dystonia. There was obviously inclusion criteria here for those people who could, um, with lived experience, who could participate. It was really essential that A, they had lived experience of disability, but B, they had lived experience of moving out of residential aged care, because we wanted to draw on that wisdom to help um, build the capacity of others. And so through analysis of the interview data conducted before the co-design project, three main themes really um, were produced from this data and they talked to, as I said before, the hopes and expectations that people had about this project. So the first theme was embracing the opportunity. The second theme is juggling hopes and fears. And the third theme really talked to, is this really co-design? What is co-design? So I'll start with embracing the opportunity. Unsurprisingly, I guess the purpose of this uh, co-design project was around helping people to get out of aged care and the people who were involved in doing this co-design work were people themselves who have made this move. So the topic was really personal and the motivation that everybody had to participate in this work was to help others. So it was a really um, significant factor here is just recognising the significance of the topic and the work to the personal lives of those involved in the co-design. Um, the opportunity to be employed was also really important to people, had varied um, level and type of interest for the participants, um, but I absolutely love this quote by Christine where she says, wow, this is me. So she read the advert for the position and just went, I can do this. This is exactly the experience and knowledge that I have and I can use this to help other people. 
And there was also um, a really strong theme across all the participants, um, both the facilitators and the people with lived experience, on contributing or the opportunity to contribute in a new way. So some of these people who were recruited um, have done work for Summer Foundation previously, although we did try to recruit as widely as we could. Um, there were still people that we have an existing relationship with who've done quite a bit of work in sharing their lived experience. And while they enjoyed that opportunity and talked to some of the positive impacts of that, um, for many of them, it was time to do a little bit more. They could sense and see that they wanted to move beyond the storytelling a bit to, as Holly says, to making a difference. And making a difference, when we kind of tease this out a little bit further, was particularly about having the opportunity to, opportunity to be involved in discussing the issue and then being involved in idea generation and problem solving. So extending from just sharing my lived experience to really saying, what can we do about this? And what's the best way for us to solve these issues? Um, so, and there was also a sense that of this beautiful holistic sense of, I wanna draw on my lived experience of disability, but I also want to draw on my other skills and experiences. And this is a really good opportunity for me to be able to do this. Um, and this idea of contributing in a new way was also significant to the co-design facilitators. Um, and this quote here from one of the facilitators was, lived experience partners have so much more to give than what we have given them the opportunity to do. And I think that was really telling. There was a sense from the team, there's a sense from the Summer Foundation as an organisation, we can do more in this space. We can actually use people's skills and experience in a far more explicit way um, to get better outcomes, hopefully. So the next theme was around juggling hopes and fears. So remember, this is prior to participation in the project. And so there were a lot of questions for everybody, really. Um, so first of all, around contributing and having impact. Christine says, it will be fantastic to give my opinions and suggestions and have them listened to. And this was echoed across all the participants. Um, there was, however, recognition that because this topic is personal and it was about drawing upon lived experience of some really negative experiences for a number of people. There was this balancing up of, is the project worthy of my personal investment? So recognising that this can be re-traumatising for people to share their experiences, or this can be, at a minimum, it's personal. And do I want to invest in that sharing if I'm not sure if we're going to get the outcomes that we need? So it was a little bit of a questioning about that at the beginning of the project as well. For all the participants, this was a really new opportunity for paid work, for interviewing and re being recruited to a, a project. Um, so testing out working capacity was um, really forefront in everybody's mind. And I think Deidre sums this up when she says, my main goal is to see whether or not I can do it. And the kinds of questions people had about their own capacity was, their own fatigue, so recognising um, just the complexity of day-to-day -day life anyway, and remembering that these people have moved, like Stacey said, you know, outside, out of residential aged care or nursing homes into more independent or individualised housing where they're doing a lot more and managing their own lives. So what else can I add into my day and still cope and manage well? So fatigue was a question. There was also a question around availability of support. So a number of people have communication difficulties or um, difficulties with upper limb movement and needed some assistance with typing or communicating or using the technology for the Zoom sessions. Um, and so then there was also questions around the flexibility of work tasks so that we could choose work tasks that really um, tapped into people's strengths and areas of interest and other work tasks that may not have been as suitable for them. Building social connections was, as if you remember back to the kind of the aims of this research, we were really intrigued to see, is this a way of building peer support? Um, and so building social connections was something we were really keen to learn more about. And participants at the beginning of the project talked about really hoping to build some peer connections, but also expressing some caution. So there was a sense of, I don't really want to say it out loud, but actually if this could happen, it would be really fabulous. Um, and as Ingrid said, looking forward to working with others who have a similar life to mine. So this idea of connecting with someone with shared experience. But as I said before, there are a number of people with significant 
communication challenges. And so while people felt um, they had the strategies and resources to communicate well, and particularly through Zoom, they were concerned because of co-design that if this was about working collaboratively, there was some worry of, I don't want to negatively impact other people's communication and other people's engagement in the project. So I hope my own difficulties don't negatively impact others. So there were a few question marks for people prior to the project commencing. I thought I would just go in a little bit more detail around the same theme of juggling hopes and fears, but from the perspective of the co-design facilitators. So for those three facilitators, this was a new opportunity to really extend the way they did the work and to try and be a bit more authentic in co-design. But there were again question marks around, can this be done well with this cohort of people? So there was a hope that this was an opportunity to do co-design well. So to shift from just consultation to genuine co-design, to shift or change the power relationships in the team that were working collaboratively, um, and also to create a space where people felt safe and comfortable with just the right amount of structure by the facilitation team so that people were able to lead and have choice and control so that there wasn't too much facilitation from the facilitators, but then um, not insufficient so that people didn't feel that they could trust the process. So they were aware that this was going to be a little bit of a balancing act to get that right. Um, and as one of the other, one of the facilitators said, being true partners also means contributing to the process. So she reflected, if this is really co-design, I need to feel comfortable sharing my opinions at times and not just being in the facilitator role. The facilitators were really hopeful that this co-design process would contribute more significantly to capacity growth um, for the participants. So they recognised that having more time to invest in each other and the process and hoping that this will be enough, so there'll be enough time to actually support people in their own capacity building and their own growth. Um, and there was also, as I said earlier, one of the co-design fields facilitators has um, both lived experience of disability and a healthcare background. And she had real questions at the beginning of the project around what's my role? Is it different or the same as the other facilitators? Is there a space for me to be a bit of a peer as the co-design participants kind of travel along this process? Or am I just drawing mostly on my facilitator skills. Um, so that was a little bit unknown at the beginning of the project. Um, and for all the co-design facilitators, of course, people were really keen to create meaningful tools at the end of this co-design project, but also people were really interested in the process. So they wanted to be able to create a meaningful process for all those involved. Um, so if the lived experience partners are the decision makers, then the tools will be great. So that was one of the facilitators who really felt strongly, if we get the process right, the tools will have relevance. Um, but then there were some questions around what is the process or the experience that people are looking for? So what value are the people looking for? Is it employment or is it about being paid? What does this look like for people in the project? And as I said before, the final theme was around, is this really co-design? And so Christine shared this, what I thought was a beautiful quote around, as a concept, co-design sounds fantastic. It's a great movement on. When I have provided my lived experiences in the past, I haven't really looked at not so much more a positive thing. So she reflected on her previous contribution and her work at the Summer Foundation. And a lot of that was around talking about the complexities of living in aged care and those negative experiences. And she saw this project as an opportunity to move on to the problem solving and being a little bit more positive and optimistic about change. Um, others spoke around, I don't really know what co-design is, but I do get that it's working as a team and I'm really looking forward to that. So collaborating with others to find solutions. So you can see the quotes there by Gabby and Deidre really talked to that idea of connecting with other people and working with other people. And that was something quite new for each of these participants. They hadn't had that opportunity before. 
but there was also healthy scepticism at the beginning of the project around is this co-design, will it be co-design, um, and even one of the facilitators um, said right at the beginning, is this what we can do and how we can do it? And is it okay if it isn't co-design? If co-design doesn't work in this space, will this be okay? So in conclusion from, I guess, my analysis of the experiences of these participants prior to participating in the co-design project, what really stood out as key learnings is that co-design was identified as a strengths-based opportunity to contribute. So it was very much about being optimistic, optimistic and seeing opportunities for change. The participants were really excited to use lived experience knowledge in addition to other skills such as listening, discussing and problem solving. So this was seen as a new opportunity. Participants were also appreciative of and motivated by the opportunity to be employed um, while recognising even at the recruitment phase that payment doesn't suit everyone and everybody's lives, but they were still really motivated and excited that this work was identified as being sufficiently important that they were advertised positions. People were hoping to build new connections, but were mindful that that might not happen. Um, and there was concern for a few people just around the impact of their own communication difficulties. And that's where I'll leave it for today. I am um, in the final stages of analysing the midway and post interviews. Um, there's a lot of data there and I really hope there'll be some future time that we can talk more about the learnings from the project as well.